Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison. I want to welcome you to this session of Humanity Rising. As we begin a five-day program on artificial intelligence, you've all heard about artificial intelligence in the news lately as one high-tech CEO after another and commentator on technology have been warning about the exponential growth of, of AI. And so we at Humanity Rising are developing a whole programmatic uh, development uh, to deal with it so that our global audience can be apprised and take the steps necessary to simply, in the first instance, understand what's happening and thereby be better able to know the kind of regulatory protocols that are required to ensure uh, that AI serves humanity rather than uh, destroys humanity, which is the warning that many uh, people have been making. In a moment, we will have our usual coherence breathing practice but I want to note as we begin today that this is June 19th. Uh, this is what they call Juneteenth uh, in the United States, the day that commemorates the final freeing of slaves after the Civil War. And so I just want to note that it was Abraham Lincoln on January 1st, 1863, that declared the Emancipation Proclamation that freed the slaves. And this was uh, promulgated at the height of the Civil War. It took another two years. It wasn't until April of 1865 uh, that General Lee surrendered at Appomattox in Pennsylvania, and the uh, slaves were freed. Uh, but it wasn't until June, uh, several months later, June 19th, that Union forces came into Galveston, Texas, and freed the last remaining slaves. Uh, Texas was the last state uh, to free the slaves. And that moment uh, is a cause for celebration and has been uh, since that time, although it's only been very, very recently uh, that Juneteenth has become uh, nationally recognized as a, a federal and local holiday. So we just wanna note that emancipation of the human spirit and uh, noted at a moment when the United States is experiencing a resurgence of racism and all kinds of xenophobia uh, through uh, some of the activities of Donald Trump uh, and the Republican Party. So it's, a, it's an issue that we've dealt with uh, from the very beginning of humanity rising and just wanna note it uh, again today as we celebrate this, this holiday. Let us now pause as we always do on Humanity Rising, just, just simply in the midst of all the tumult and the chaos of our world, uh, to create inner coherence through the very simple act of breathing together. So in a moment, you'll hear the sound of a bell, when you hear that bell, just breathe in very slowly for about five and a half seconds, then you'll hear another bell and breathe out. We're gonna take 10 breaths together and then we will commence our program. But welcome everyone to Humanity Rising.
Thank you, everyone. It's always good to breathe together wherever we are uh, in the 130 countries that uh, view our programming on a regular basis. It's my pleasure now to uh, introduce a good friend and colleague, uh, Tom Eddington, uh, who has been developing our program uh, on artificial intelligence uh, with Lisa Miller at Columbia University. Uh, he's the CEO and founder of uh, Endangered Global. Uh, he's a very successful business executive and business coach and consultant. And he's passionate about uh, these matters that are challenging humanity in very unique and critical ways. Uh, so Tom, I want to thank you for everything that you have done to promote Humanity Rising and the programming that you consistently bring uh, to our global community. Uh, and now on artificial intelligence, and I turn the program over to you. Many thanks. Thank you, Jim. Uh, it's great to uh, great to be here again today, and uh, looking forward to the the, the lineup and the uh, the group of panelists we have joining us this week. Uh, you know, folks who are in the in the technology world have been talking about artificial intelligence and its possibilities and its potential for, for decades now, probably 40 or 50 decades. And certainly in the, scientific, in, the, in the science fiction world, writers have been talking about AI, uh, both the, the shadow side and the possibilities of, uh, of AI. And uh, we've been living with artificial intelligence for, uh, for several years now, whether it's Siri or uh, self-driving cars that uh, Tesla and others have, have made available. So we've got AI in our lives. We've had it in our lives for some time, uh, but unfortunately, like most technology, the, the technology gets created without um, people thinking about, uh, thinking about the intended and unintended consequences and without government oversight, government regulation, and so, we're now faced with um, a technology that's, that's being uh, evolving uh, over the last um, months and years now that is unlike any other technology that humanity has created. We, we now have technology that has the ability to, to advance on its own accord without human intervention. And uh, Tristan Harris in particular about 18 months ago, got on my radar talking about the, the genuine concerns he had around AI and the, and the potential that it could result in the extinction of the human species. So we wanna be talking this week about AI in the context of our relationship with humanity, uh, how we use AI in a constructive way, in a positive way that is for the benefit of, of the human species and not the destruction. And so over the course of the week, we'll be joined by a number of technology folks and others, but we thought it would be important to start the, the program today with sort of a meta view of, of um, AI in the context of spirituality, humanity, and uh, how do we have this technology in our lives in a, in a constructive and positive way. So. Um, Delighted that we have uh, Georg Bach with us today, not, uh, not just behind the screen, but on the screen to, to talk about AI, as well as a uh, wonderful colleague and friend, Dr. Lisa Miller. Lisa, if you want to join us. And uh, welcome. And uh, if you would, would like to uh, introduce the, the folks you've invited to, uh, to join us today, today, that would be great. Wonderful. Thank you, Tom and Jim and George. And this is such an extraordinary global community that you have built to look into the most timely matters to rapidly join together globally to look together into what could be a real horizon for us as a humanity rising. Today, I am tremendously honored to open up our discussion on AI, its possibilities, its limitations, and what we might be mindful of towards human flourishing from a global point of view with Peggy Delaney. Peggy Delaney has spent her career as a profound humanitarian working at a global level. And she is quite a big thinker, which is why I was so grateful that she agreed and took our invitation today to share from her big point of view 
I'm going to read a bit on Peggy because it's quite extraordinary. Peggy Delaney is chair of Synergo Global Systems that create the most urgent problems of our time, poverty, social justice, and injustice. And she disables those statistics to promote trust and collaboration among grassroots groups and government and business leaders and organizations working together, people who otherwise would not have access to each other so that they can develop long-term relationships and new pathways to overcome poverty. In 2001, she co-founded Synergios' global philanthropic circle with her father, David Rockefeller, to support philanthropic families in using this approach. Peggy is an honors graduate of Radcliffe College, holds a doctorate in education from Harvard University. She sat on 30 nonprofit and corporate boards. And I'm telling you of many, many, many people who are coming together right now, Peggy has a rare vision that is united by an ability to get people working together as we are here. So she is really the ideal inaugural guest speaker and discussion point person for us today. Peggy, welcome. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Tom. Beautiful. I'm also going to introduce Johnny Rose and Ryan Sispanic, both advanced doctoral students at Columbia University who've come to learn from our discussion today. And as we move into the middle or so, start to ask questions and reflect. These are people who are, you know, very, very hardworking, very bright, emerging psychologists and activists, spiritually minded doctoral students. So they will inherit our world. And it seemed apropos that as we pass the torch forward through the generations, they have the opportunity to hear, listen, and offer their own experience as we meet. We are met, met by thousands of people today around the world. And so this is quite an honor. I thank you, Tom and Jim and George for bringing us together. Johnny, do you want to uh, uh, join us via uh, video? So much rapping. I'm so excited to be here with you all uh, and share openly heartfelt experience. Thank you. And uh, Ryan, good to have you with us today as well. Thank you. Good to be here. So Lisa, as you and I have uh, been planning this week, uh, we've had a number of conversations around where where this where this technology exists in in humanity, where this conversation in particular could go. And part of uh, what we've talked about is the the real threat that AI has. And uh, you know we we've, we've talked about it in the context of it's it's not. Um, artificial intel uh, intelligence, it's adolescent intelligence um, in terms of how we think about the development of the human species and where the technology is right now. And, and much of the technology is acting like a, an adolescent, uh, very impulsive um, and very reactive. We've also talked about it in terms of many of the people on the uh, on the development of artificial intelligence are on the autism spectrum. And they're lacking emotional um, uh, empathy, compassion, and some of the dimensions that we think of when we think about human consciousness. And yet it's a technology that is very much um, potentially risking the, the existence of, of the human species. And so um, Peggy, and I know you're only with us for about 45 minutes today. so. Maybe we invite you into part of that conversation, whether it's the work you've done around leadership or some of the other uh, dimensions of, of who you are and how you think about um, human existence on planet Earth. Was that my opening? Uh, I'll, I'll add more if you want more, but I, I think you're probably well equipped to, uh, to bring in your thoughts. I could probably go just about anywhere from that. <laughs> so I guess, I mean, I do, I do think of this from the human perspective and uh, how in some ways 
combination of COVID and not everybody having access to technology and huge differences in wealth and also access to communications and access to information means that the likely beneficiaries of this to start with the positive are going to be already those who have greater access. And so since that issue of social justice, climate justice is foremost in my thinking, I worry a lot about whether it will be a very narrow um, benefit. One could argue that you could make this available to improve all humans' lives, whether they have access or not. And I'd love to hear that perspective and more about it. But the race um, among the producers to simply put it forward, not waiting for the kind of regulation that I think is essential to avoid the potential for, for example, making all elections invalid um, or doing terrible things to the planet or humanity is, is so greedy that it really makes me worry that the kind of increasing gap between those with access and those without is just going to increase as a result. So that's my, that's my worry. And I'd love to hear others' perspective on that. And, and I'd also love to hear positive perspectives about how this could actually address some of those problems. The biggest point I think is tremendously important that what we feed AI will determine what AI learns and what is then produced and who, who gets to feed AI. Now, we can take very, very focused challenges and problems, and AI can be a tremendous benefit in figuring out, for instance, what are the bacteria in the soil that would enable a certain crop to grow? Very specific, focused question, figure this out. But unleashed willy-nilly, hey, let's drop this in the public square and see what happens. Let's drop this in the public square and let it be fed by what comes willy-nilly is, is really... a uh, mass experiment, which is um, in real time on real people's lives. We saw what happened to teenagers when social media took hold and sort of rates of anxiety and depression and addiction and the disintegration of spiritual life from the public square, from social connection. AI could learn anything, right? And I think that this, this is our opportunity to Peggy's point to make sure that the biggest questions facing humanity and its holes in our systems can be addressed. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons I was eager to accept your invitation, Lisa, is that you framed it in terms of uh, how does this or could this relate to human flourishing and also to spirituality? So those are areas that I'd love this group to explore more. Yeah, I think one of the uh, you know one of the the troubling um, parts of the conversation is that at least that I've heard from the, the technologists who are talking about AI. They're talking about the need for alignment. They're talking about uh, making sure that the AI that's being developed doesn't have its own autonomy. But there there aren't conversations around spirituality. There aren't conversations around humanity and thinking about the development of the technology in that context. And many of the leaders who I've, I've heard talk about the development of AI and their excitement about it, when asked about religion, when asked about spirituality, when asked about um, some of the dimensions that we'll, we'll be discussing today, they don't have any personal practices. They don't have any personal experience. It's not how they live their life. And um, that's very frightening. For me. So then what might be, you know, Tom, to your point and Peggy, your sense of opportunity, what might be a, a vision of deliberately through human, our collaboration, feeding AI, setting AI to a purpose that actually enhances the spiritual conditions of our society? How could we think about a team or a set of questions or priorities that sort of say, hey, go chase this. Um, and what would those be? What would be the, you know, the four or five priorities that 
we could say, hey, these are real challenges right now on our earth. And how can we set up the conditions and the input information to see what possible vision could be generated for these four priorities? What would those be? So what, one of the things that comes to mind immediately is, is there a way to use this uh, to benefit um, education? And I would say, including emotional, social and emotional learning for all. Uh, is there a way that it could be used to support teachers in their own growth in that realm? Because one of the issues of introducing those elements of education into the school systems is that if the teachers haven't learned uh, those skills, how can they possibly communicate them to students? So let me just throw out, how could we use AI to really universalize a form of education that is not just fact-based, but that also develops us as human beings? And I don't have an answer to that, but that's, that's a dream. So I will say that Peggy Delaney has been an enormous leader in creating whole child education in developing the really in the United States, it has now become almost a new normal due to her leadership to have whole child education alongside the curriculum that lands on your desk in K-12. So her point I think comes from the stance of expertise. How can we make this ever more um, rich and penetrating of the classroom and the teacher. The first thing that comes to mind for me is that AI may hold an individualized approach that rather than a group learning a core training program, once a core training program's transmitted, could AI in a constructive way with inputs around the possibility of thriving classrooms be used to help any given teacher in his or her leadership of that classroom? Could AI be a way of offering feedback, drawing from what other teachers have done, looking at case-based systems of what's happening in this class versus another. It's a very focused implementation based on real knowledge that we have so far. I mean, I'm thinking of some of the leaders in this field from, from different countries, but um, I think of Catalina Barragan from Mexico, who in the previous administration had gotten the federal government's agreement to introduce social and emotional learning into all the public schools, K through 12. That unfortunately was undone by the next administration for the not invented here thing. And of course, Dan Goldman and his amazing work um, and Rachel Kessler, who's unfortunately passed, but who wrote The Soul of Education and the Novo Foundation, which funds this kind of work. And it might be an interesting challenge for them to think about how they could expand uh, their work in this, um, taking into consideration potential positives of AI. Yeah, you know, certainly, uh, you know, in the uh, in the education space, when we think about publication or public education here in the U.S., having been rolled out a hundred or so years ago, it was very much the industrial model of how do we get education to as many people as possible as cost effectively as possible. And so uh, to your, your point, AI does hold the possibility of that bespoke education for each child uh, done on a mass scale and relatively affordable. So that, that has the, the feeling of, of being very positive. And so how, how, do, how do our policymakers uh, and educators think about the application of AI in this context. So maybe to take on a second subject, um, which is climate. Is there a way that AI could really help us make the difference in terms of climate? And I'm going to talk about two examples, um, which are already almost outdated because they when they were invented, they didn't use AI. But you know, one is what uh, Bill Gates in his in his for profit developed, which was a, a cell phone technology that could allow farmers anywhere in the world to look at the chemical composition of their soil and what it was lacking. 
And so that was an incredible thing to enable farmers to address certain issues in the, in the soil. However, it did not address the issues of bacteria in the soil. And, and it also relied heavily on chemical inputs rather than organic inputs. So for sure, there must be ways in which we could take that diagnosis and, um, and if we can shape it in a way that really deals with a regenerative kind of agriculture, just using agriculture for the moment. And then a second is an effort in China uh, through an organization, the initials of which are IPE, to allow any citizen to report any um, circumstance of pollution of air, soil, or water to the government so that it could be addressed effectively. Could there be other ways that would include the participation of citizens, but through satellite technology or whatever use of AI that I can't even imagine, uh, that would make this possible throughout the world and would pinpoint these kinds of things so that there could be quick results and quick reactions. So those are just two little examples of how I, I can dream that AI technology if programmed right, and this is always the issue, you know, can it be programmed so that it's climate positive? Yeah, you know, Peggy, I think both of the extraordinary access to, if I'm a farmer on a small farm anywhere on the globe, access to me, but also there's discoveries in aggregate, which could be extraordinary if we have this now bottom up greater, if you will, net to harness the knowledge that's out there. There, and it's a way to check you know, the original ideas of actual hands on the land farmers and see what's working, what's not working based on the actual outcome data of their farms. So it, it's, it's an extraordinary amount of new information that could lead to new standards. Um, we've lost so many ancient ways of thinking about farming that did work. Um, so it, it's in some ways, I think um, one of the few ways that we are having a more democratic series of voices informing a, a standard rather than a few multinationals. Yeah. yeah. And then Lisa, I would hope that you would also weigh in on this. Um, how could AI uh, support what I'll call for the moment, not defining it, spiritual growth, a sense of connectedness to a larger whole, regardless of whether it is God or nature or a different religion so that it could promote the commonality of our connectedness rather than the differences. Uh, and again, it's a question, I don't have the answer, but if we don't focus on that kind of thing, I could easily see AI sharpening differences and conflicts around the world rather than the other way around. It's such a beautiful point. And we know from science that there is a universal spiritual brain that we all, every one of us are born with an innate neuro seat of spiritual awareness. And of course there can be human variants or we can strengthen different components, but we all, there is a universal component of spiritual awareness and it includes core phenotypes, a capacity for perceiving, seeing, unitive love, a capacity for seeking transcendence through a practice, meditation, prayer. Uh, ability to discern from a deep spiritual perspective what that means for our morality and most of all our service altruism to one another so we know there are core phenotypes of spiritual awareness that every faith tradition embraces that we are born to see with or without a faith tradition could we use a platform to bring people together where this is the assumptive frame, where we connect with one another in a way that is loving and holding and guiding, rather than willy-nilly, you know, comparing who's going on where for vacations and what people's strengths are over others, you know, the sort of competitive, um, the adaptation of capitalism as a moral theory has guided so much of social media. You know, who has what and who and who's going where and who, and how many we count people as if we were counting dollars. How many people are watching the site? Could we reshape the public square 
in a way that is informed by our deep natural neuro seat of spiritual awareness. And I think so, we could start programming. This is a public square that is guided based on unit of love, that is guided based on I vow relationships. There is so much opportunity to know one another through pluralism, to have conversations where I can't wait to hear about Diwali or Ramadan or Easter or Hanukkah. I can't wait to know you on you know, the next block or the other side of the world through this way. And that is a stewarded conversation. I think that if we just leave the door open, anything can happen. But if we can program and support a stewarded conversation, it could be something like a spiritual UN. It could be something where we know each other in the, the deepest way. Um, that, is, that is an extraordinary possibility for AI if, if it is stewarded. And I'm thinking of examples like Humanity Rising or the Wellbeing Project, which is a global initiative to, to focus on what are the elements of human well-being, which can very much be related to spirituality, or a conference I just came from in Iceland called the Spirit of Humanity, which brought people together from all over the world to, to really practice the kind of inner work that leads to the open-minded, open-hearted, open-listening uh, that makes it possible for leaders and people who don't even consider themselves leaders to be willing to reach out across divides and to connect in positive ways. So I think there's probably umpteen other kinds of initiatives like that that could feed into the kind of platform that you're talking about. Peggy, I think about your own leadership work in helping people on really a quest, on a journey out of pain or trauma into a deeper spiritual sense of love and connection and then contribution. And I'm wondering if you know that type of unfolding and pilgrimage could be sustained through some type of platform that could include many people. Um, and do you, see, do you see a possibility for what you've discovered as an arc of journey, renewal and contribution to, to be opened to people this way? So I do, and I think there's potential for platforms that could help encourage that. Just to say in a few words, one of the things that I think gets in the way of people interacting in a positive way and people coming to a sense of serving with love, which is one definition of, of spirituality and a sense of interconnectedness, is the traumas that so many people face, almost everybody and those tend to make us close down and freeze or be enraged or be in fear or be in shame or be in grief. And I would love to find ways that beyond the kind of small group or even large group initiatives that are happening, including, by the way, through the use of psychedelics, I mean, getting over trauma um, through the use of MDMA which is gradually becoming legalized under the FDA in the US and I imagine in other countries as well. There's so many ways that this can happen, but right now they depend a lot on personal interaction. And the question is, can this go to scale? I, and I, I don't know the answer to that, but I'm very hopeful that there, there are ways in which we can create, as we've managed to create on Zoom in in many of the many of the group calls that I've been on since COVID, a sense of belonging, a sense of community, without which it's very hard for people who are traumatized to begin to trust, to begin to allow themselves to be vulnerable and to explore what are the obstacles that are keeping them from being their most effective uh, and most whole selves. The result of which virtually always ends up in the desire to serve with love. And if everybody on the planet were serving with love, we would be without a lot of the problems that we are today. And the question is translating that into some form of AI platforms where this could really um, take effect in a, in a much larger way. Peggy, I think about the individualized nature of what's now possible that, you know, looking at case-based analogies, others at this moment in their path, um, options at this moment in one's path. 
what had been an intimate group of maybe 10 or 20, if it was expanded to 20,000, could perhaps this platform give an individualized experience informed by the many people who've come before? That's, that's very helpful. I'll just mention one platform that's gone pretty much to scale that does a version of this, and that's the Presencing Institute, started by Otto Sharmer and now headed by John Heller. And uh, they've put 250,000, maybe it's quite a bit more than that by now, people through a training program uh, online in which they develop many of these skills that are necessary both to, to overcome some of one's own obstacles, but also then to take that out there and work with other people. So it doesn't all have to be online, but if we can build uh, the cadre of what we call bridging leaders and uh, what the Presencing Institute calls people who've been through this deep dive and come out the other, other side with the ability to think systemically and to recognize what their own obstacles are and then to be much more creative in, in generating solutions. I think we can do a combination of in-person, online, and then who knows where it goes from there. And, That's and, a beautiful thought, seeding these, these, these yeah. other lived communities in augmented reality, which is a space that makes sense to so many more. Yeah. And Tom, you had asked for four. So I've suggested three so far, education, climate, spiritual connectedness, and I'm going to suggest economics as the fourth. And how can AI contribute to an economic system where there is both greater opportunity, but also something aligned with what people are calling the circular economy, which is less wasteful, uh, opening up more opportunities for more people. And in, a, in, a, in societies where a lot of the work is gonna be automated, how can we completely rethink the meaning and the cost and the payment for work. Is there a whole other way of conceptualizing work and what people get uh, as a benefit for doing that work? And can that be extended beyond the most technologically sophisticated societies? And when you're dealing with say an agricultural society, and I'm, I'm thinking of, this is a tiny experiment that a group that I'm working with through Synergos did in Nigeria, just as one example of how you can turn things on its head, that cassava, which is a huge, um, a huge product in Nigeria, was always uh, um, done by men. That, and what the women did was simply to peel the cassava, and then it was thrown out. And then it was discovered that actually, if you process it right, that cassava peel can be very good animal fodder. And there's a huge issue in Nigeria, a conflict in many countries actually, between the herders and the agriculturalists because more and more land is being taken up by farmers and there's less room for people who are herders of the animals. But if you both thought about, oh, oh so what I, I didn't finish the example. So, the women, because they were already the peelers of cassava, um, formed a business and they are now selling the cassava peel, uh, peel for animal food. So first of all, this can also help address this conflict between the herders and the agriculturalists because it's a different form of animal feed that could feed some of the herds that are being, you know, that, that are running out of grass to, to eat. But also, if you think about the benefits of having animals um, feed on the remains of crops uh, during the fallow season. You could develop agreements as we have done in a few places in Nigeria, whereby in certain seasons, the herders are invited into the agricultural land. And while they're there eating the remains of the produce, they're also fertilizing the land with natural fertilizer. So these are the kinds of things I tend to look at grassroots solutions but how could, how could AI help to magnify those so that first of all, the, the technology would be available. We would know little things like the cassava peel could be good for animal to feed. We can discover many more of those things. And then what is the social technology? 
And what is the economic result of resolving some of these conflicts uh, and enabling a more regenerative food system that is available to more people? So that's, those are just a couple of examples on how one might rethink the whole entire economic system, which of course varies from country to country, but which right now tends to concentrate wealth in the hands of fewer people. And identify those pathways. I mean, that's a very you know, brilliant pathway that you've connected and maybe given the reach, AI could start to see those pathways. So Peg, you've identified four systemic change possibilities, education, the environment, spiritual connection, and inequity of wealth. And I'm wondering if we think about setting up uh, a way in which you know, your word was perhaps regulate some form of encouraging boundaries that could help steer this moment of radical innovation towards these really globe-saving, earth community-saving goals. You know, what, could we brainstorm around that? How do we get people moving in the right direction so that this isn't driven narrowly? You know, there's important small questions AI can answer, but there's also this sort of willy-nilly profiteering that could happen that, that is reckless. It's, you know, if AI at the moment does stand for adolescent intelligence, you wouldn't give a 14-year-old the keys to a moving truck or an 18-wheeler and say roll. You know, so how do we start to think about this moment? You have so much leadership experience in guiding people together in the right spirit and moving in the direction that is life-giving. Do you have some early sort of creative thoughts about how we can encourage people? Well, um, just before you came on, Tom and Jim and I were talking about the Earth Charter as an example of something that had been developed uh, that really sort of would set a standard and could, could there be a similar charter for AI, which I think is a wonderful idea. And, you know, the risks are, of course, that those in power don't feel they have to abide by the, the guidelines that are developed. Um, in my thinking about both how to create leadership and, and also how to influence things in, in a particular direction, I always start with what, um, uh, what is it called? Um, attitude change, how it happens. And one of the big principles is that peers influence peers. And so if I'm trying to address a problem in, in my purview, and there's certain people who are taking a position that feels like it needs to shift a little bit in terms of being more inclusive, I try to think, okay, where are the barriers to that inclusion? What are the organizations or institutions or individuals that are presenting that? And first of all, uh, if I can't get to that institution or that individual, who do I know who could? And who is the closest to their point of view who at the same time is more inclusive in their thinking so that you try to you try to get as close as possible to those who might be opponents, but who could be influenced and then who could influence them. So, and I, I bet by the way, that's something AI could help us with, uh, identifying those connections um, and, and even help us figure out the strategy to move there. Um, but it's not, a, it's not a whole solution and you know, we have in this world um, politicians and uh, people of wealth and uh, people of political views that are going to be antithetical to a more inclusive um, and more just society and climate policy and education policy. So how are we going to bring them together? And, you know, I, I tend to work individual by individual or group by group, but we're going to have to develop some bigger strategies. And again, you know, here's where AI could be helpful in thinking through what those strategies could be if the right people are doing the programming. And then how do we get to the right people so that they have an interest in doing that? That's a very compelling, beautiful model. 
And I do see, I think, your, your vision that AI could be helpful in seeing the through lines, the threads of who turns to who. Um, you know, you have made major system change. You've made major system change in education. You've brought together leaders from around the world in higher purpose. And I'm wondering what you have found over the decades of your leadership inspires people. How do you put your message? How is it that you get people who are very busy to want to come together for, for the highest good? How do you approach people? What's your way of being? Well, one thing I would say is that if you can get people into a natural environment and get them to give up their cell phones for preferably several days, but even a couple of hours, uh, and then engage in practices uh, that are not threatening, but allow them to just step back from the pressure of daily living, that almost everybody both feels the the incredible beauty and feels connected to the beauty of the natural world. And that come, somehow softens. I mean, our monkey minds, our, our brains that are going 100 miles an hour and that are always planning and worrying and you know offsetting and all of this, if we can get out of those for long enough to sink a little bit toward the heart center, it's amazing what that does to people. Now, that requires interpersonal connection. I think it's possible to do that to some extent on Zoom. I don't know what the role of AI could be in that. I do think what you said earlier about there being, you know, there is actual kind of a spiritual aspect of the brain. And if we can tap into it, we're more likely to get people's attention and to get that sense of longing for greater connection, greater harmony uh, to, to arise in them. And if they're not living in a state of fear and a state of rage, um, it, it is much easier to get there. So I don't have a universal answer. And a lot of it is person to person or at least by small group. Um, but I would also think about introducing poetry and dance, music of any sort, because those are the kinds of things that one of my teachers, Bill Plotkin of, of um, the Animus Valley Institute says that if you're trying to get to your soul's true purpose in life, you have to kind of seduce the ego to let go a little bit in order to drop down and understand what is the purpose with which you were really born. And, and that takes, it's not a, a minute by minute process. It's a day by day and week to week. So another thing which actually has happened a lot over the internet is meditation practice, you know, yoga practice. So if we could figure out ways to make available beautiful images um, of art or nature or whatever, some of the incredible films that David Attenborough has been doing with the advanced photography. I mean, I, I am entranced when I watch that and it makes me feel so connected not just to the earth at large, but the, the plants that grow under the water and, and with the fast photography, how it comes above and it's just so incredibly beautiful. There's so much that can be done that is inspiring in that way and attractive. People want to look at it, want to be part of it. And again, that, that probably is something that could be fast forwarded and expanded through AI. But Beautiful. those who so are about have to figure out how to do it. And to your words, Peggy, the deep longing in people for ultimate love and connection and the deepest purpose, not just little P, but big P, our purpose on earth in this moment. Um, I think that that needs to be answered by any next generation form of convening in order to engage us. That that's really where we are. Post COVID, we are bottom line yearning, to use your word, for ultimate connection, love, and significance that is true. And that is the only thing I think that will really attract us. So maybe I as opportunity is to start from that point. Um, if we could encourage people and convene them in that, in that common purpose. And you are a master at convening people in highest purpose. So I, I wonder if just in these last few minutes, you might be willing to connect and answer questions from our advanced 
doctoral students who I know admire your work and you know, this is an honor for them to meet you. So Ryan and Johnny, would you like to ask anything of Dr. Delaney? Um, hi, it's an honor to be here. Thank you for, uh, for having me. Um, such an interesting and profound topic. I guess my question would be, what is your sense of AI as a, a learning entity um, or from a consciousness perspective? And how does that <clears throat> compare to uh, maybe the human consciousness and maybe even issues like cloning, uh, DNA cloning and, and sort of that, that bigger angle? Gosh, you know, that was one of the questions that I was gonna put to the two of you because I'm assuming that because of your age, you are much more up on what those possibilities are. Can I, can I literally turn that around and, and ask you? Lovely. I'm gonna pass that one to Johnny. Well, you're, <laughs> invited, you're being invited to do it is the most important part of science, which is imagine. You're being invited into a creative vision of what could be or what, what's possible. So there's not a right or wrong answer, but I, I think Dr. Delaney is opening a door for you both. Yeah, so that it's a topic that I was considering and, and reflecting upon. Um, and I think I was thinking about the universe at large and whether it's a closed system or an open system, whether we can, like a model, like an economic model, um, whether you can program and you can know from a deterministic perspective what's going to happen or whether it's an open model um, and we can't necessarily determine um, all the factors involved. And I think from an AI perspective, I feel like it's a closed system. So when we're creating models and we're creating systems, it's inherently closed because it's what's available to us. <clears throat> it's within the human uh, perception, uh, cognitive perceptual system. And so I guess that's my, my very brief uh, response to that, Dr. Miller. Well, then, I mean, could we pursue that a little? Because, you know, there's a lot of fear that uh, humans can only input so much, but that it looks like there could be potential that that AI could go beyond human capacity. And so, and most of the fears of that are, well, they could destroy humanity or destroy the planet or whatever. But is there in your view, and I'm really asking this as somebody who doesn't know, and you can be someone who doesn't know too, but do you think that it could be possible if this happens, that there could be a good in, good output for that? In other words, that we are, our imaginations are limited, but if AI can go beyond that, is there a way in which they could help us solve that being a, a closed system rather than an open system? You know, think, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead, Johnny. I think a really interesting point to explore here is AI's potential for transforming education insofar as taking away the grunt work, the nitty gritty, and opening the human mind to more abstract, deep thinking questions that allows individuals to truly answer them with their hearts. Mm -hmm. And are you saying you think that could be a possibility? I absolutely do. You know, I think there's a lot of fear in education right now with um, AI being used to, to cheat and whatnot, but I think it will take some time for education to really adapt to using AI as a tool, as a useful tool for students to allow them to think more abstractly, more big picture, and not have to worry about the nitty gritty as much. I, I love that idea. And, you know, my background is in developmental psychology and going from, you know, in Piaget's terms, from concrete to abstract thinking. And um, I guess the question is, and probably if AI gets smart enough, 
it could actually help students, kids move successfully from one to the other through mechanisms that sometimes teachers who are simply taught to teach subject matter rather than this kind of open thinking and getting increasingly abstract. So, I mean, that, that does sound like something that could be built in and could stimulate um, students thinking and awareness and all of that. And then the next question would be, how could that get connected to awareness, self-awareness, other awareness, uh, spiritual connectedness? You know, I so appreciate Dr. Delaney, Brian and Johnny appealing to our sense of expansion and the tremendous goodness that's in and through the universe and us. I, I just in the couple minutes we have left with Dr. Delaney, you mentioned the Earth Charter and Ryan and Johnny, you may recall the Earth Charter is really a statement that is validated because it is the summative agreement by consensus of the world's people, 10,000 representatives of religious and civic organizations all around the world to the letter agreed on a statement of Earth rights that includes us humans. So, and, and to Dr. Delaney's point about regulation, could, is it possible there could be a summit for a possibility and limitations? Is it possible that in the way that you draw people together, Dr. Delaney, people could be drawn together, maybe it'd be marvelous if you were part of leading this to bring people together to agree in deep purpose and perhaps even to the letter on the extraordinary possibilities and goals that we, the inhabitants of earth set, perhaps those four are foundational for AI and what must never be the case, which is a 14 year old driving an 18 wheeler. So how, how do, how now could we do that? I mean, I'm sure we could. And the, I guess the question um, that comes to me is if one were to think about doing something like that, what would be the, the diversity that we would want to include? that would go beyond any kind of traditional uh, way of thinking, you know, not just science versus humanity, not just geographic, not just class background, um, but, you know, what would it take? And, you know, we could ask that question to, I don't know what you call, I know you can ask any kind of question and they'll come up with it. The AI will come up with some kind of answer. It'd be interesting to see what kind of answer that that would come up with, but but also to have enough of a diversity of human beings behind it to ensure that it was a truly inclusive process. And you know, you'd have to select human beings who were really open to lift, listening to differences, because if if the participants were closed, closed-minded, like closed systems, uh, you could end up nowhere. And I think there's probably a lot that we could learn from the Earth Charter process to figure out how they got there. Well, my word is God willing, and that's inspired and that feels miraculously possible. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And I, I will look forward to seeing a, a text or not a, some form of the rest of the half hour, which I can't participate in because I wanted to hear more from the two of you, um, Ryan and Johnny, and I'm sure you'll have a chance to elaborate on your own thinking. And by the way, I didn't mention the diversity of age, but that's gonna be critical in any kind of uh, effort to do this. And to your earlier point, consciousness. Yeah, yeah, very much. So thank you, everybody. thank you. And Peggy, the, uh, the, the program today has been recorded. It will be on YouTube. So we'll send you a link to the whole program. Thank you so much. Thank you for being with us today. Thank Thanks. you, Dr. Delaney. Magnificent, magnificent. So shall we circle around and sort of mine for gold here, figure out you know, how this is landing in terms of possibility, in terms of perhaps pulling people together in a council like the Earth Charter now at this prime moment. You know, Tom, what are some of the advantages to doing this now versus when we know AI better in three years? Yeah, there, there are a couple of pieces to that for me. And so one is that, you know, we've, we've seen it with, with uh, climate change, where climate change is, is happening exponentially 
and and whether it's our policy leaders or people in industry have been taking incremental steps and moving at a pace that isn't sufficient with the exponential change and the systems changes being affected by climate change. We saw it again with COVID where the viral uh, expansion was happening at an exponential rate beyond humanity's compa- uh, capability or capacity to understand exponential growth. And AI holds that same reality, that it, it grows at an exponential rate beyond what human beings are capable of, uh, of handling. So I, I, I guess my answer to your question would be, we don't have the time to wait three years to put in the, the, the guardrails, to think about all of the potential applications, to be thinking about how to deploy for, for positive reasons, whether it's in the classroom or around environmental or social change or economics, et cetera. All of our global systems will be and are being impacted by this technology. And I, I don't believe that we have the, the luxury of time to wait and see. Mm-hmm. But I'd love to hear from Ryan and, and Johnny your your perspectives. Yes. On the possibility of self-regulating, self-potentiating, directing AI. For instance, those four goals. I think the urgency of addressing uh, the rapid growth, the exponential growth of AI is um, extremely important. Um, I don't have any sense of how to regulate because I know that um, the technology is so accessible to so many people. Um, but definitely, I think it's an imperative. And there's a sense of urgency, uh, Tom, that, that you referred to, which I think is really, really critical. And Johnny? I think it's interesting to think about AI as not so much artificial intelligence, but more of the idea of machine learning. So can we, as conscious, loving humans, allow the machines, the machines to learn a sense of self-regulating and learn how to rein in possibilities? In, a, in an empathetic and conscious way, not, not treating AI as a, as a foreign entity over there, but really bringing it in close and cultivating it within us. I see, Johnny, I think that's a, an excellent point. And the idea of cultivating sort of the the machine itself to develop the spiritual core almost to the, to the extent that it, that we can the technology, um, how we would extend that to all the technology and the different systems that are available. Cause I know even now there are so many that already exist, um, that I definitely do not have, um, have a vision on. Totally Ryan, just going off of what you were saying, this sort of, this sort of global council of a summit, what Dr. Dr. Miller was referencing, enabling different spiritual leaders, government leaders, ethical leaders to come in and create core principles through which the AI can self-regulate. And I think that the spiritual communities and the religious communities would probably be at the forefront of that um, in tandem with the science communities and and uh, governance structures around the world. What an extraordinary opportunity then to put AI in service to the finest that humans have accomplished and envisioned for ourselves. So if it were spiritual communities feeding in, if it were the four directives of Dr. Delaney, as well as perhaps those of fellow communities, much of which I think would center around those four imperatives. You know, what if we put the right things in? Uh, 
Yeah, there's a, a comment uh, posted by Shannon in the uh, in the chat talking about augmented intelligence uh, for artificial intelligence. And so using it in that capacity to augment human intelligence, human and uh, human capability. And maybe that's a, a helpful and constructive framing of, uh, of AI, that how do we use it to augment and enhance the human existence on the planet and for each of us as individuals in our own uh, life's journey, our own spiritual path to augment uh, what we haven't developed in our, uh, in our life's journey. And yes. that, word, that word augment, Dr. Miller, reminds me of the term from awakened awareness, where we have the awakened perspective, which incorporates sort of that spiritual transcendent. But then there's also the, the more atomistic um, elements of achievement awareness, where we need to get certain logistical functions done. Um, so merging those two in an augmented fashion, I think that word was a little bit synchronistic, I think. Um, Well, that's actually, you've raised a very interesting point, which is um, may I, AI inductively derive the type of accurate relationships between human events, many of which include synchronicity and may there even yet be others. So, you know, Ryan, you study synchronicity. Do you want to share a word about, you know, is it possible to um, feed in to AI a, an eye towards how, how do naturally occurring events actually arise? I think definitely AI could help process different events, um, looking at patterns that are occurring in the natural world um, to make sense of things. And I think we see that in even in weather forecast models being used now, um, we're taking into account different factors in the environment to make predictions about what's going to happen in the future. And I think that using similar um, similar features of technology, we can input different information to get sort of uh, knowledge that maybe wouldn't be available to us from a rational perspective within our own human minds. Or perhaps we have blinders. We have acculturated blinders about how life unfolds, and with the bold, you know, open eye of AI, inductively deriving patterns in the weather as may go hand in hand with human conduct or human um, morality, transgression, goodness. I mean, we might see that there's through AI an accurate eye onto the way that human consciousness interacts with the consciousness of earth. A lot to think about there, Dr. Miller. But, but it could take us out of this sort of residual droning vestige of hardcore mechanistic, you know, we take Newtonian models of billiard balls. And even though we've made advances in spiritual thinking and quantum inquiry, there's really a, a center field um, residual droning mechanistic view of the world and a mechanistic view of our morality that what I do here really only affects me and my family or maybe my country. And that there's over here and there's over there. And we have radical separatism still undergirding our view of the world and our moral action. Maybe AI could give us bottom up, you know, bold, open-eyed views of the pattern of events and our role in human consciousness and action and affecting over there with over here. Yeah. <laughs> So if you were to put together, Ryan, Johnny, a council, how would you think about putting this together? How would you think about bringing the right people now early on to set the overarching goals for this sort of super form of machine learning and put the hard stop on the prohibition of what it must never do? I think... Um, I think the Earth Charter would be an excellent place to start. I think going to the, um, the members who came together to, to sign that, that agreement, and I think that would be uh, using that model as a beginning place, I think that, that could be effective. 
and drawn precedent of this world convening, this world council, if you will. Johnny, do you have thoughts about what the hard stop should be and what, you know, would you agree that those four goals would be your four goals? Would you add a fifth? Would you? you know? I, I think those are great four goals. I also think AI has the potential to allow us to cultivate our own our own value system. Um, and I really think in, in developing this consortium, it's so important to get leaders from many different fields who have many different perspectives. You know, everyone from religious leaders, spiritual leaders to political leaders, business leaders, community leaders. I think diversity of perspective in this area is so important. So, Johnny, are you saying that perhaps in those four, right, education, the environment, spiritual connection, and inequity of, of resources, perhaps throughout them, or perhaps as a fifth, the ever evolving uh, capacity of humanity to know who we are and augment our capacities to our evolution, which does of course overlap with education and spirituality, but could be you know, defined for the global community as, as an AI that elevates us, that always makes us more aware and more um, good onto one another in the earth. So that it'd be an inherently elevating, or maybe that's the superordinate statement, an inherently elevating um, use of the tool that we agree upon. Absolutely. I think, I think morality definitely falls throughout the four. It doesn't need to be a fifth, especially with the way I was talking about education leading more towards abstract, bigger ideas and allowing individuals to cultivate their value system in an environment, in a loving, safe environment where they, they feel comfortable listening to their inner self, given all the data that AI can provide. Tom, do you have thoughts? Um, do you have Jim and Stan and George here? Do you have yeah, I was going to suggest we uh, we invite uh, Jim back into the conversation, um, and uh, you know, in, in terms of this, the, you know, certainly the, the the four areas that we talked about are, are critical, but it, it feels like we're you know we're overlooking some other important areas, whether it's social justice or human interaction or um, how to how to integrate. Um, Understanding of human consciousness, of, of human history, into uh, into how people see themselves and their place in the world. Well, thank you, uh, Tom and uh, Lisa and Ryan and and uh, Johnny. I also want to invite Georg Balk uh, into join the conversation because he's really been uh, uh, leading our. Um, exploration in this domain uh, for a very long time. Uh, so Georg, if you want to join, that would be good. But what I would say um, is that the opportunity to build on the Earth Charter and the vast amount of work that a lot of people did from all over the world during a critical period of environmental concern uh, in the aftermath of the Rio uh, uh, summit, uh, et cetera, uh, is the foundation upon which we need to build if we're going to ensure that the regulatory framework for AI is built on something other than just sort of subjective opinions of uh, sort of uh, intellectual um, metaphysics, shall we say, uh, uh, that are uh, mostly unformed and uneducated if you really get down to it. And, and I think 
the the questions that you're raising, Lisa and Tom, around consciousness and AI, spirituality and AI, uh, are the 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 foundational questions that need to be taken very seriously, and on the basis of which any realistic um, uh, framework for AI need to be built. And the Earth Charter, you know, has already done that work. <laughs> and th there's no sense in, you know, uh, remembering the Earth Charter nostalgically as something that was done in the, in the, you know, the 80s and 90s, and it was a great idea, but now the world has passed it by. No, it did, it created the foundation. And if we can link it now to artificial intelligence, we would do something that I believe would be both unique and compelling and imminently uh, exciting to people because uh, earth consciousness is the basis of spirituality and consciousness for us humans. Uh, and uh, so I am very enthusiastic, as Tom knows, about linking the earth charter to this because i think it's it just grounds us uh in the way we need to be grounded uh for something this urgently critical That's we don't true. have to recreate the wheel here ladies and gentlemen <laughs> the, the wheel has already been created we now have to apply it uh uh to this uh, code red issue that's emerging uh in our midst that's my view so Jim, that frame to me sounds like a reconvening of the world's peoples, you know, that someone out will be the descendants of those um, who were there in the 80s and 90s. And that there's mm -hmm. a reconvening of, if you will, um, the finest in us coming forward as global self-governance. Yeah. And highly inclusive to Dr. Delaney's point. It is the people yeah. of the world. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, you know, Peggy was involved. Stephen uh, was involved. Uh, the United Nations was involved, you know. Stephen headed the drafting committee. I mean, yeah, just NGOs were involved and they did an extraordinary amount of work. Uh, and I, I, I think that if we could partner between Humanity Rising and, and what you're doing there at Columbia, and maybe Synergos and other organizations and convene an ongoing process that would combine, you know, humanity rising broadcast, but in-person conferences uh, to really focus on uh, what would a regulatory framework for AI look like if it was based on the Earth Charter. I think it would be exciting and I think it would draw uh, significant attention that would not be there if it was just sort of us kind of doing an AI thing <laughs> without the kind well, of grounding you. that's already uh, present. Because in its deep bones, what it is, is as you're saying, Jim, about I think almost the natural rights of yeah. all earth, including us humans, um, yeah. as it now pertains to this new chapter we face and what the earth chart attributed a statement of the natural rights of earth that we are endowed through the force of life yeah. with certain unalienable rights and that now Bill, you're breaking up just a little bit and Oh, I think we lost you a little bit, uh, Lisa. It, it kind of warbled out. So I didn't get all of what you said, uh, but I agree. <laughs> I think I think we we have something very, very seminal that's that it's being initiated here. And if I understood your point correctly, it's got us all start with the fact that we are nature. We are earth. And so consciousness, spirituality, everything that humanity's created is nature in some fundamental way. 
um, extending itself and through humanity beginning to be reflectively conscious of itself. And therefore, uh, the Earth Charter is the, is the right place to begin uh, any conversation about AI. And the Earth Charter holds you know, rights. The Earth has yeah. rights. Yeah. Each of us as part of the Earth have rights. And that, that notion of inherent rights, I think, aligns with the Constitution of the United States of inherent rights rights, exactly. self-evident rights. You know, exactly. Jefferson's first draft of the declaration said, we hold these truths to be sacred, that all men are created equal and independent. It's a foundationally spiritual document. Exactly. That, so Tom, what, what's resonant for you in this vision of a really a reconvening, if you will, of the Earth Charter, certainly in the lineage of the yeah, I, I appreciate your your perspective, Jim. Of you know, there's no need to recreate the wheel. The, you know, there there's a, a very effective process that was created and resulted in the Earth Charter. Um, I think if if I were wanting to amend anything, it would be that it not just be a document, but there's actual um, yes. you know, adoption, adoption by countries. Yes, that um, it has quote unquote teeth so that um, that we actually see a you know not just a, a wonderful process and a wonderful a conversation but we actually see uh, industry leaders uh, and um, governments around the world embracing it holding it to to um, to its intent and yeah. so that that needs to be a, a piece of this because of the, the potential threat well, and I think the, the first place we would reach out, you know, are to the thousand uh, CEOs that signed that statement saying we need a moratorium until we figure this out. Yep. Uh, there's a lot of people that are saying we need to figure it out, but they don't know how to figure it out. And if we come in with a cogent proposal based on serious work that has now gone back decades I think that we would have a an attractor that would be quite extraordinary and I think extremely well received because you're not coming in from an ideological point of view. It's not American. It's not Chinese. It's not anything. This is the earth and people all over the world came together, um, as you were pointing out, uh, Lisa, around some inalienable rights of both nature and humanity that we've forgotten. You know, they used to call it in the Middle Ages, natural law, that uh, that's what Aristotle called it, is that we have an internal compass. We have an internal sense of rightness um, that is deeper than language and deeper than intellect and reason, but the heart knows. And I think the Earth Charter recaptured that and that is, to me, the monumental achievement. I always thought that those guys should have gotten a Nobel Prize. I because I think they pulled off something that the world desperately needs, but somehow marginalized. And we have an opportunity to bring it front and center at arguably the most urgently critical issue around artificial intelligence. And I, I uh, uh, would put a lot of time and energy uh, into this uh, to help make it happen, because I think it's one of the most important initiatives that I've heard about uh, for some time. And to be able to work with you, Lisa, with all your, um, uh, you know, your both your connections, but the elegance of your mind and the sensitivity with which you're approaching this would be pure pleasure. Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. Now, as you know, Dr. Stephen Rockefeller was the head of the drafting committee. Yeah. Mark Strong and Mikhail Gorbachev appointed him head of the drafting committee. And Dr. Rockefeller got 10,000 people to agree in deep meaning, in appreciation for the implications of their core concepts, and then to the letter, to the letter. You know, so there are some people on earth who hunt uh, in the sea to survive. And there's some people on earth who will go to the mat to prevent 
the death of any living being in the sea. And in a very deep way, he got these people in total integrity to agree. And so I think once convened, we need we need stewardship of that type of statesmanship, whether exactly. we can uh, knock again on Dr. Stephen Rockefeller's door. I'd like to knock on Dr. Peggy Delaney's door, who has held systems together around the world. And, and think about how this is moderated. Uh, really, this is this is a states person like at the end of the day, we can all convene on Zoom. We can benefit from you know, AI even distilling common themes, but it, it is the end of the day statesmanship that's gonna really make this cohere. Um, we're gonna have people with enormous vested financial interests and people who are profoundly vulnerable. Exactly. Um, exactly. And what's in good in us is common. Well, why don't we have Ryan and Johnny give quick comments on this uh, possibility and then uh, Tom, Lisa, uh, tee us up for tomorrow. I would love to, I feel like I need to do my homework in terms of understanding the dynamics of the Earth Charter and the history around it um, to see sort of the evolution of it and where it stands now in terms of um, having, being able to incorporate this uh, AI agreements into it or building upon that. Yeah. And that's part of it, to, to, to educate this new generation on some of the foundational work that was done uh, sort of before you were even born. I don't know how old you are, uh, but certainly when you're a, to a toddler. And, uh, uh, and that's, as Peggy was saying in her final comment, there's, there's a transgenerational aspect to this that we, we don't want to forget what the elders have done as we seek to, to create um, a, a wise guardrail for the development of a technology uh, that Yuval Harari says is the most important development in the history of the human species. The importation of intelligence from biological systems into mechanical systems. It's an extraordinary moment that we're that we're in, and uh, to have something that's transgenerational would be would be priceless. Would be priceless. And Benner, it fits from the lineage of natural rights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Stephen Rockefeller also talks about holding on to that which around the world is the richness of regional religious traditions, cultural traditions, and together at the same time, having a global place of moral meeting. And exactly. this is me as profoundly in service to that highest school is a global place of moral meeting. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Jim, one thing that you mentioned reminded me of um, the invention of nuclear energy in the atom bomb. I'm cautious to bring that up, but I know that in the aftermath of that at the end of World War II, that was the big, um, there's so much movement around um, bringing awareness to this new technology so much. And I think that generationally, a lot of that has slipped through the cracks as well. Um, it's no longer yeah. the foremost thing that everyone is sort of talking about and warning about. Uh, so that just brought, came up to me as, as you said, that this is one of the most or biggest inventions of technology in, in the human, human species. So yeah. it's interesting, while, while many things have changed in the past 40 years, I think it's so important to bring the essence of the Earth Charter to the present insofar as it really harped on our global interconnectedness. And can we make down decisions from that place? Mm. Yeah. So Tom, uh, Lisa, what's on for tomorrow? Well, tomorrow is a, is a continuation of, uh, of today. We've got uh, a conversation on how do we bring compassion and empathy and ethics into this AI conversation. And we're being joined by 
Mila Orlinska. She's the founder and CTO of iMind, of the iMind Institute. And we're also being joined by Eddie Pyrick, the founder of the Global Artificial Intelligence Association. And they've been doing some extraordinary work around uh, hosting conferences in places like Florence, Italy, and, uh, and in uh, Austria, where there have been centers of homes of art and music and uh, thinking about how do we bring that dimension of the, the human spirit into these conversations uh, through, through acts of compassion, through, uh, through empathy and uh, dimensions of human consciousness that are oftentimes absent in these conversations. So uh, it will be another wonderful conversation uh, as we continue this week's program on artificial intelligence and how do we get to alignment. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, all of you. Uh, Lisa, thank you very Wednesday. much for your partnership in this. I think we're on to something very significant, and I want to acknowledge it and thank you for it and look forward uh, to next steps. And Ryan and Johnny, thank you for joining us. Reminded me of my doctoral days uh, back at Cambridge. Uh, and that'll bring us to a close for today, uh, everyone. Uh, you're welcome to the after session chat. You'll see the link uh, in the chat box. And then as Tom has indicated, tomorrow we'll just continue this dialogue um, uh, for the next uh, four days. This is a five-day program on one of the most seminal issues confronting the human community uh, today. Thank you, everyone. Bye for now. Thank you.